Welcome to the Online Success Journey Podcast, your opportunity to discover and learn from entrepreneurs like yourself. This is not your typical podcast, but a place where you can get the real story and find out how real people encounter speed bumps and detours, but journey through to find success. Now here's your host for the Online Success Journey Podcast, Patience. Everyone and welcome to Online Success Journey. This is episode 154. Are you ready to join the clan? Today we have Susan Pepcon, an author and a career coach. Susan transformed her career and developed a scientifically validated approach to helping others to do the same that she teaches in her best-selling book, Ditch Your Inner Critique at Work. Frequently quoted by New York Times, Wall Street Journal, First Company, Harvard Business Review, and many other publications that have tapped, tapped her for career advice. Her passion is helping individuals thrive in their career. Hello, Susan. Hello, Patience. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for coming. I know the clan is anxious to hear your story, so let's get started with the basics. Can you tell my clan about your background and what you did before you went into being an author? Certainly. Well, I started out as a classically trained musician, And uh, I realized um, that I was going to starve to death if I didn't do something else um, because um, I wasn't quite at the level where I was going to um, get a seat in a symphony orchestra. And um, so I wasn't quite sure what I, and I didn't have the money to go back to school. So um, I decided to go into sales um, because I thought sales was an, um, a career where I could make money and um, not have to go back to school. So I went into um, sales selling technology solutions, and I did that for um, uh, over 15 years. And while it was uh, good financially, uh, it was not good emotionally. I really hated the work. And um, my company was purchased. And when it was acquired, my job was eliminated. And my position, um, uh, because my position was eliminated, I had to figure out what to do. And I really was not sure. So um, I then... uh, I I live in a part of the world, I'm in Boston, and there are a lot of colleges, and um, I went to work for a local college, um, uh, helping them bring business in um, for uh, uh, executives, uh, doing business development for executives, and uh, I did that, and then I was asked to join a university in a career center also doing something similar. Um, Anyway, this is a very long way of saying that eventually I started to coach students, um, helping them prepare for interviews. And um, it occurred to me that I loved to do that. I loved helping um, students get ready for interviews, and it dawned on me that this is what I love to do. Um, And eventually, after that, I left there and uh, got trained as a coach, um, which is what I do today. And so that led me eventually to get additional certifications and training in coaching. And I wrote my book because I realized that there is a way for people to find happiness in their careers, Um, not the way I did it by just uh, trying to figure it out on my own, but through, as you said, patience, um, really uh, through some scientifically validated ways of getting there. So that's why I wrote my book, and that's a little about my story. What a background. What a journey, Susan. Okay, <laughs> wow. What do you think not many people become authors? Um, I think many people become authors because they have something to teach. I, I think um, becoming, a write, becoming an author is really about wanting to teach something um, at, at the heart of it. Uh, it's not about making money because um, unless you're very famous, Uh, To begin with, um, writing a book is not about making money because it's not a money-making proposition. Um, It's it's really about wanting to share something with the world. But others, they become authors and they don't become really successful. So what is your secret of having a best-selling book? Well, you can have a best-selling book. 
So having a best-selling book is a lot about marketing. And um, there are people who've written books, certainly thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions before me that I learned from in terms of how to market my book. And so I took a lot of um, advice from them. Um, It took me a year to write this book. And so I I wanted people to know about it because there's so much competition out there. Um, And so I learned, uh, you know, how to market a book. I developed a launch team. Um, I asked that launch team to spread the word, to write reviews for the book, um, which people were gracious and kind enough to do. And um, that's part of the way in which it became a bestseller by, you know, by my aggressively um, marketing it and getting the word out there, you know, through having a launch team, through social media um, and other methods um, like that. You can't just expect a book to sell itself. <laughs> that will never happen. I thought there was a secret. Okay. We know you love the in- teaching others and you love the, the way you are coaching the students at the university. But really, Susan, why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I love it. And as you could hear from my story, it took me a very long time to find what I love to do. And I want people to find what they love much faster than I found what I love. And I think that's really important in life. We spend so many hours at our jobs and, you know, most of us uh, have to work because we need money and that's fine. Um, You know, we need to make money. But um, why not enjoy what we're doing um, while we're at it? And so I wrote this book, you know, to help people find um, a passion um, while they're making money. So uh, can anyone be an entrepreneur or are some people more cut out for it than others? Um, I think some people are more cut out for it than others. And I think some people's life circumstances lend them more to being an entrepreneur than others. Uh, as again, as you could hear from my own circumstances, I did not become an entrepreneur right away. I, I, I built a financial stability uh, through having jobs first uh, before I became an entrepreneur. Um, that's what worked for me um, because uh, becoming an entrepreneur involves risk. Not that having a job doesn't have risk. It does. I mean, you know, anybody can lose their job. There's no such thing really anymore as job security. But you have to be willing to take risk as an entrepreneur. And you you have to know that up front and starting a business um, and, and having that business become successful generally takes longer than one thinks uh, it's going to um, at the at the start. So that's important to know, and you have to know what your risk tolerance is. And if it isn't, if you're if you're not willing to take a risk, that's okay. You might be better cut out to work for a company or an organization. You've been in a business for a long time. What have you learned from business as a whole? Wow, that's that's a really good question. I I, I think I've learned uh, many many things. Um, I, I've learned about myself most. Mostly, and um, I've learned about other people. What I've learned is what I like. You know, I've learned about my interests, um, my passions, and my strengths. And and I've really learned how businesses work. You know, I think when we're young in our careers, you know, we want to do a good job. Um, but also when we're early in our careers, our goal is really to understand, you know, it's, it, our job is to do a good job, but it's also to learn as much as we can. And um, I, I think um, when I think back on my career, so much of it was about learning, you know, learning about myself and learning about how companies work and learning how business functions. And um, that's part of what work is about. It's, it's about continually learning and taking in information and, you know, um, learning what you want and what you need and learning how to be successful and also what you don't want. Okay, you said you had the, to be trained as a, a coach. So I yes. guess you had a mentor or a coach yourself. What is the most valuable thing your mentor has told you? I think the most valuable thing, I've had many mentors and um, I also mentor women now, um, you know, in, in, um, uh, in, in my own work, um, I mentor groups of women. Um, I, I think 
um, the most important thing that mentors have taught me is to be authentic um, and to be true to myself. Um, n- to be who I want to be and, and to be not to be who somebody else wants me to be. Because I think for too long in my career, I was trying to be who somebody else wanted me to be, um, to follow a model of success that I thought it was a, a model that others saw. Um, but it was not a model that made me happy. And then when I started to look at what I authentically wanted, which meant, you know, giving up um, money and uh, giving up certain things, um, then I became much happier because I really was um, willing to look at what I wanted and not what I thought others wanted for me. Let's talk about your book. First of sure. all, how did you come up with your title, Ditch Your Inner Critique at Work? So um, the way I came up with the title is um, I work with people, most of whom are in their mid-careers, and they're uh, very successful. But in spite of how successful they are, most of them are um, very hard on themselves. They're very self-critical. And um, I started to wonder why and what could be done about this. And, And I was like that too. And I realized that this is something that all of us face Um, that all of us have what I call the little gremlin um, that sits on our shoulder and tells us we're really not good enough, um, we're not as good as other people think we are. Um, And so I decided to write that book because I think that this is a universal problem that most of us have and most of us face and don't talk about. And I wanted people to be able to address it and realize that um, it's that e, that we're harder on ourselves um, than we need to be, and um, and that there's there are ways of fixing this, and that's the reason that I wrote the book. You mentioned that only thirty percent of people feel engaged at work. Why are the numbers so low? So one of the reasons that the numbers are so low is because people are not using the God-given strengths that they were born with. So. Um, we were all uh, were all born with um, 24 uh, character virtues, um, and we all have them in different degrees. But sometimes, what happens at work is that the way the work that we're asked to do does not necessarily align well with the character virtues or strengths that we have. And when this happens, we tend not to be engaged at work. That's a major reason why. Um, A second reason why that people are not engaged is that they don't get the recognition that they deserve. You know, um, we all want to be recognized and acknowledged for the work that we do. And oftentimes we have managers that just don't uh, seem to understand the importance of that recognition. And so those two things combined um, cause us to um, not be engaged. And those are the two primary reasons why the, the percentage of people who feel really engaged and empowered in their jobs is as low as it is. Okay, you sat down and wrote this book. Took you one year to write yes. it. Well, when you are writing this book, who did you have in mind? So I had in mind career professionals um, who are uh, who want to be successful in their jobs, but who also want to be happier. So um, I, I want I wanted people who um, are successful but are feeling not happy, who are feeling um, stressed, uh, who are feeling anxious. Uh, who are feeling worried. Those are the people that I wrote this book for. We often see people who think they are successful, they have everything, but then you hear, when you go to talk to their friends and they're like, no, they are not really happy, they are depressed, they are not really how it is. So how can we find the happiness? Because it so seems first, to be a big thing. Right. So first we have to understand what happiness is and what it isn't. And uh, one of the things about my book is it's it's based on research, um, and 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 it's uh, it, the research is done by um, social scientists, uh, psychologists, 
Um, and it's not research that the average person would know about. And so one of the things that um, scientists have found is that money and status do not bring us more happiness. So we need, we need a certain amount of those things. I mean, we have to have a roof over our heads and, you know, we have to have a nice place to live and food on the table, of course. But beyond a certain level, more of those things do not buy us more happiness because we just adapt to them. So if we get that next promotion or if we get the faster, shinier car, well, we'll be happier for a little while, but, you know, then we just get used to having those things. But what does bring us greater happiness is when we feel that what we're doing has meaning. And so what I talk about in my book is um, what does bring us happiness. And I, I describe the difference and I tell stories about, you know, what is happiness and what it isn't so that people can look at themselves. And I have exercises in there as well so that people can gauge where they are. You know, are they measuring the right things in their lives to see if they're happy or not? And based on that, you know, they can, they can determine if they're making the right choices or if they need to be looking at some other factors um, to start moving in the right direction to bring themselves greater happiness. How do we measure our happiness in our life? We measure it really in three ways. We measure it, one, if we feel that what the work that we're doing is meaningful, and um, that doesn't that doesn't require that we have important jobs to do that because um, we could have jobs that are viewed, you know, we, we'd be working in cafeterias uh, and find meaning in the work that we do. So that that's number one. Uh, and that's probably a, one of the major factors. If we find that we have meaningful relationships you know, if we find that the colleagues that we have, we, we can have trusted relationships with, that's another factor that brings us happiness. And as I mentioned before, the third factor is, are we using our strengths, those capabilities that we were born with, um, that we, we come to naturally? Um, if we're using our strengths, though, that also brings us greater happiness. Um, so those three factors together are likely to bring us much greater satisfaction in the work that we do. Let's talk about the people who want it, to make sure before they even start thinking about writing the book or thinking about um, going to look for the next uh, job to make them happy or bring them more food on the table. But they want it to make sure it is perfect, but they, are, they want everything to be perfect before they even start. What do you say to those ones? So I would say, uh, don't worry about having the book be perfect before you start. Just start writing. Um, in my case, uh, I had an outline and I also had, um, I worked with someone who was my editor. So one of the things that I think is very helpful when you're going to do something as, as like writing a book, which is a long process, is have somebody who is going to hold you accountable, um, meaning they're going to check in with you to see how you're doing and um, read the book as you go along. And um, so the person that I worked with did this for me. We had an outline and we agreed to a schedule. And, um, and that was very important because, uh, she would read each chapter as I finished it. And, uh, that forced me to write it and not worry about whether it was perfect or not. Uh, you can't worry about whether it's perfect. You just have to get it onto the page and then you can fix it as it goes along. If you're worried about whether it's perfect, it'll never get done. So just start writing. So not to worry about perfect or excellent. Excellent. I thought they yes. confused. They just like, okay, I want it perfect. I want it excellent. So what is the difference? So excellent is something you can measure. Perfect is something you can't. Perfect is always out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but but how do you define it? Excellent is something you define. So if you have, for example, if someone's going to write a book and they have an outline and they say, OK, this is chapter one and this is what's going to be in chapter one. Then if you've written what's in chapter one, then that's excellent. But if you say I've written chapter one, is it perfect? What does perfect mean? And that goes for anything that we do at work. 
So that's really the difference between excellence and perfect. Excellence is something you can measure. Perfect is something you can't. Perfect is a trap because it keeps moving. It keeps moving out there and out there and out there, and you can never achieve it. In your book, you devoted a really entire chapter on failure. Uh, now, yes. Susan, we are trying to be successful, and now you really devoted the whole chapter on failure. So how, yes. how are we going to be really successful? Well, failure is part of life, patience, and, and that's why it's in there. And I think anybody that thinks they're going to be successful without failing is fooling themselves. You know, um, in the Boston area, um, I work in the center of the biotechnology uh, field. Uh, so there are hundreds of companies here that are trying to discover new medicines every day. And in this field, people face failure every single day. And what, what um, people in this field will tell you it, is that without failure, they would not know how to succeed because failure is part of the discovery process. And entrepreneurs will tell you the same thing. So failure is part of learning. And uh, really, that's how it should be viewed. That's why there's a chapter on it. Uh, some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, you know, Steve Jobs, who founded Apple, he was fired from a job. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs have failed and failed many, many times over. So we have to stop looking at failure as the end of the road. It's, it's really failure gives us information that we need to move on. Okay. Where can we find this book? This book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's available in um, a paperback and it's also available in a Kindle version. How can we get in contact with you? So um, people can find me um, on my website, which is Positive Workplace Partners. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, Susan Peppercorn, uh, Twitter at Susan Peppercorn, and also on Facebook at Positive Workplace. So people are um, more than happy to connect with me in any of those places. And also on my website, Positive Workplace Partners, I have two free eBooks. So anyone who goes to my website is more than happy to uh, download my free eBooks. And um, I'd love for you to connect with me on any of those places. Thank you for sharing. So, Clan, there will be more from Susan in a moment. If you are listening on one of the many podcast platforms rather than my website and you are encouraged by Susan's journey, go to onlinesuccessjourney.com for a bonus portion of the interview. The Online Success Journey is a wonderful membership community built for people searching for the path to success. We are one big clan and you can be part of this community for free. Once you have joined the clan, click on part two of Susan's journey or over 100 other journeys that are available and learn how you can find the right path for your own online success. That's a wrap, clan. Remember, success is a journey. Patience and Susan. This is not the end of the journey. We hope you've enjoyed listening to part one and want to be sure you know there is a second part to this and every journey podcast at onlinesuccessjourney.com filled with even more success tips, uplifting stories, and even a bit of fun. There are dozens of episodes only available to the members of the Online Success Journey clan. Check out the website and click on Join the Clan for more information. Patience would like to thank you for listening to this podcast and she has a free audio gift for you at her website. Go to OnlineSuccessJourney.com for instant access to this gift. Of course, you know that listening to the journeys of others helps each of us chart our own path. So make sure you're subscribed to be notified as each new interview is posted. There are so many ways to stay connected to the online success journey and to listen in. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we appreciate your help in telling others. One of the best ways to share the benefit you get is to rate and review it at Stitcher and other sites by clicking the stars or completing the ratings form. By clicking the thumbs up and leaving a comment on YouTube or liking and sharing the podcast on social media. To review the podcast within iTunes, simply open iTunes to the podcast, click on Ratings and Reviews, then write a review. 
On behalf of Patience and until next time, thanks once more for listening. It is our hope that this podcast will guide you on your own online success journey.